This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Welcome to the Neurology Podcast. My name is Adam DeHavanon. I'm a vascular neurologist at Yale University, and I'm fortunate enough today to be joined by Gustav Edgren, who is a cardiologist and epidemiologist at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Gustav and his team recently published a paper in JAMA titled Intracerebral Hemorrhage Among Blood Donors and Their Transfusion Recipients. And the topic of today's podcast will be to delve a little further into this high-impact paper and its implications. Gustav, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. So I really enjoyed reading the paper, and as I read it, I wondered what motivated you to investigate this particular issue. Why did you hypothesize, or did you hypothesize a priori that there would be an increased risk of intracerebral hemorrhage in patients who receive transfusions? Yes, we did hypothesis this. And over the years, I've done quite a bit of hypothesis-free or hypothesis-generating studies. But in this case, I was actually giving a seminar in London in like 2019, I think. And there was a group of people based at UCL mainly who were presenting mostly animal model data on transmissibility of amyloid beta-associated disorders. And a few things were really striking from this research that it was becoming more and more evident to me that these diseases might be transmissible. They're not infectious in the sense that you sort of sneeze in the subway and someone else gets Alzheimer's disease, but certainly that there's some transmissible element to things like Alzheimer's disease and cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is a thing that we wanted to study. And among the presentations at this meeting, there was a presentation by, I can't remember who, but they talked about a series of studies that really originated as autopsy studies on patients in the UK who had been diagnosed with the iatrogenic CJD or carcel Jacobs disease and who had been all treated with cadaveric growth hormone early in life. And the striking thing about this small series of autopsies was that they found very unusually high levels of cerebral amyloid angiopathy associated pathologies in their brains. And this was unusual and unexpected because they were too young and they really shouldn't have all that much of these amyloid deposits in their cerebral vasculature. So what the researchers had done was that they went back and tracked down stored vials from the growth hormone that these patients had been treated with and detected amyloid beta in, in these vials. And also showed that it's possible to induce CAA or cerebral amyloid angiopathy in animal models by by injecting these animals or inoculating them with samples from these vials. And I'm an epidemiologist first and cardiologist, and so I have to admit that I didn't know much at all about CAA. But when I heard about this, I figured, well, we really should investigate this because it, it reminded me or was indicative of that these disorders might be transmissible. And if they share some etiology with other misfolding or amyloid type disorders like prion disorders, then certainly there's risk that they might be transfusion transmissible, which other prion diseases seem to be. And so even sitting in this meeting in, in the UK or in London in 2019, in the hotel late at night, I started working with the data we have remotely trying to figure out a way for us to study it. And eventually, the weekend after or something like that, I had the first round of results that indicated that something leading to multiple intracerebral hemorrhage might possibly be transfusion transmissible. So that's really the starting point for this study. I do want to delve in further to several aspects of the study itself. But first, I was hoping to hear a little bit more about the registries. It certainly for somebody in the United States where we have some regional and semi-national registries is always exciting to hear of these larger efforts in your case in Sweden and Denmark. But yeah, what can you tell us about your data source? The data source that I work with mainly is called SCANDET, which stands for Scandinavian Donations and Transfusions. And it's a sort of binational federated register or database where we have data on blood donors, blood components, and transfused patients. 
And the unique thing about this data is that in Sweden, it goes back to the late 1960s. And I built the Swedish portion of this during my PhD in between 2003 and 2007. And a similar database was built also in Denmark at the same time. And then the useful thing about this register or this database is that we can track the blood units from the donor to the recipient. And thanks to something that we've referred to as the national registration number, which is a unique identifier that's given to all inhabitants of both Sweden and Denmark, then we can track people, who they are, when they donate blood and, and who the recipients are. And we can link that data to all these other health outcomes registers that we have in both Sweden and Denmark, which includes registers for cancer occurrence and hospital care and causes of death and, and all sorts of things. And in Sweden, we can track between reg- sort of generations so that, you know, I know that this person is the mother of that person, etc. And it, it opens up for some really useful research because we can identify disease occurrence among the donors and we can identify disease occurrence among the recipients and link the two, which opens up the possibility to study transfusion transmission. Wow. In terms of the capture of outcomes here, and I guess as well, exposure status, this was based off administrative claims, off coding data. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's not really claims data in the sense that this is used for reimbursement like it would be in the sort of insurance-driven system. This is all based on discharge diagnosis or discharge summaries, which the purpose of which is not claims per se, but it's rather as a summary of why a patient was seen in a hospital. And you can imagine that any data like that it comes with a lot of flaws. And, and those flaws will be big for things like urinary tract infection or symptomatic things, vague disorders, etc. But they'll be fairly good for more tangible things like an intracerebral hemorrhage. And then, of course, there's like a, a gradient in between where you know, the specificity of the coding will be less good for some things and better for other things. And in this case, we really hypothesized that the thing that we're looking for is cerebral amyloid angiopathy. It's an amyloid beta associated disease where you have amyloids or aggregates of this protein amyloid beta, which builds up in the small vessels of the brain, leading to a propensity to have these spontaneous hemorrhages. And the, the curious thing about the uh, CAA is that it's fairly strongly associated with Alzheimer's disease, so that in a lot of patients with Alzheimer's disease, you see a lot of these deposits in, in the, the vessels, although that, that mix isn't perfect. But I should mention perhaps that, that even before we started with this study, we had published a paper where we actually looked for possible transfusion transmission of Alzheimer's disease based on similar earlier animal model data, and we didn't find anything. And we might want to get back to that later on, but but you can consider that, that Alzheimer's disease is a typical example of something which might not be captured all that well in a patient register like this, because you have to make it to the hospital to end up in the discharge diagnosis. And so most patients with Alzheimer's disease will not necessarily go to the hospital for it, right? Whereas patients with intracerebral hemorrhage, they will certainly end up in the hospital unless they die outside the hospital. But even then, we would capture it because they would have a cause of death in the cause of death register. So when we started to study this, or we wanted to study this, we learned quickly that there's actually no specific diagnosis code for CAA that had been used in Sweden at this time. So we instead used a proxy exposure and a proxy outcome, which was spontaneous, repeated or recurring intracerebral hemorrhage, where we defined it to be spontaneous based on there not being other causes for intracerebral hemorrhage in the registration. So for example, a patient with a traumatic brain injury would not be counted as as a spontaneous uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. So we excluded individuals with trauma or vascular malformations that were known or tumors, etc. And we tried to limit it to individuals who didn't have any other causes of their hemorrhage than, than it being spontaneous. Um, and and so, you know, you have to admit this is a proxy exposure, uh, uh, but it was the best that we could do with this type of data that we have. Gustav, can you tell me the main findings of your study? So the main finding is that among patients who receive a blood transfusion from a donor who goes on to have multiple intracerebral hemorrhage, that those recipients have an increased risk of themselves suffering an intracerebral hemorrhage as compared to those patients who receive blood units from unaffected donors. 
And what is the implication of that? Specifically, what does that construct suggest and how is that related to your hypothesis? So I'm a cautious person. There's a non-ignorable possibility that we're wrong, right? And that we've screwed up somehow and that this is all a fluke. But our hypothesis or our speculation, at least, is that this might be indicative of CAA or cerebral amyloid angiopathy being transfusion transmissible, which is a scary thing, to be honest, because these are fairly prevalent conditions. The lifetime risk of CAA is in the ballpark of 20-25% or thereabout, and it comes with some sometimes catastrophic consequences. Going back to the capturing of exposure and outcome uh, in a data set like this, can we just touch on something slightly in the weeds here, but in these hospital admissions with intracerebral hemorrhage, are you restricting that to the primary position? So in other words, this is the discharge diagnosis that in the U.S., because this is uh, billing data, it sort of justified their level of billing, but I don't know in this data set how that actually plays out. But in other words, that this is a preferred or primary code for the hospital encounter. In the main analysis, we allowed any position of this code. But then in addition, we actually fitted models where we looked for it as the primary diagnosis. And, and you could consider the following reason to include considering intracerebral hemorrhage at any position in the coding structure. And that would be, imagine that you have a patient who suffers, let's say, a myocardial infarction, and they get put on potent blood thinners, and then they have an intracerebral hemorrhage right after that, which happens not so rarely, even in my practice. And you could then say, well, the main diagnosis here would be the myocardial infarction, and this is the secondary diagnosis would be intracerebral hemorrhage. And if we exclude those, we might actually miss something very interesting because a lot of the hemorrhages associated with the CAA actually occur in individuals who are put on blood thinners. And so that was the main reasoning behind allowing any codes to be used in any position. But, but we did run sensitivity analysis where we restricted it to, to patients who had had intracerebral hemorrhage as the main diagnosis. And that was, frankly, that was the vast majority of these events that we saw anyway, because in most instances, I mean, if you have an intracerebral hemorrhage, that's the reason you're in the hospital and not the bunion yeah. or whatever, right? And the results were consistent in this sensitivity analysis. Yeah, they were consistent. I don't remember exactly, but I think that the hazard ratio, the relative risk was actually a little bit higher when we restricted it to main diagnosis only. The overall relative risk was in the ballpark of 2.7, which means that there's like 2.7 fold increased risk. And I think it was slightly over three when we restricted it to main diagnosis only, although that the confidence limit was probably wide. Er. The exposures in the study include not having had an intracerebral hemorrhage after your donation of blood, having had a single episode and then multiple episodes. The multiple episodes, as Gustav mentioned, a proxy for cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Can you tell us in those subjects who had multiple episodes of intracerebral hemorrhage, what was the sort of time period, understanding there's variability, but are these events tending to be clustered within months or years separating, you know, the multiple intracerebral hemorrhages? The time between the hemorrhages in the donor is relatively short, and we can talk about why, but a priori, we said that we want these episodes to be at least 30 days in between, and meaning that we don't want things to be you know, just a rebleed of the same hemorrhage, so to say. So we, we said at least 30 days apart, but in the majority of times, the median time was less than a year. And part of the reason is, of course, that these patients die to a very large extent, which means that not a lot of them will have lived for a long time after their first hemorrhage. The case fortality rate of a CAA-associated hemorrhage is in the ballpark of 30-40%. So even among healthy blood owners who have suffered these hemorrhages, the, the, the probability of surviving for a long time is fairly limited. And then a second thing that maybe you didn't bring up, but which is important here, is that that the transfused patients are transfused for a reason. And those reasons are, for the most part, come with a fairly poor prognosis. So that the expected follow-up of transfused patients is, is fairly limited, you know, depending on the setting and, and so on. The majority of these patients will be dead within three to four years. So the median follow-up in the transfused population is not that long, 
there is this tension between both the exposure status of multiple ICHs, the proxy of amyloid angiopathy, if you will, being a rare event in the data set, and then the outcome (laughs) being rare. That is kind of a setup for uh, wide confidence intervals, as you mentioned earlier. And as an epidemiologist, what is your approach to, you know, you have a good plausible biological principle to explain your results, but given the sort of limitations of the data, how did you approach that in, in writing the paper and interpreting the results? The thing here is that this exposure, which is receiving a blood unit from a donor who later goes on to develop a particular disease, is more or less randomly allocated. Because at the time of the transfusion, you know, you're not going to know the future health outcome of the donor, right? And so unless there's something relating to, you know, blood allocation that's related to the future disease occurrence or the future risk of ICH in the donor, then you're going to have this very nicely randomized exposure. So it's like a naturally randomized study. I'm saying that, you know, knowing full well that it's not really a randomized study because there are some possible, you know, confounders, but it's theoretically randomly allocated exposure. It turn means that if there is underestimation of the true exposure prevalence, meaning that, you know, we see 0.1% of our patients receive a blood unit from a donor who goes on to develop multiple ICH. And let's say that in reality, it should be 5%. It just means that we underestimate the exposure and we have like a polluted comparison group where we have ICH among the donors who end up in the no ICH group. That's potentially possible. Uh, In that case, because we have a randomly allocated exposure, it just means that we would underestimate the true relative risk. Adding to that is that we also underestimate among the transused patients because A, they die from other things to a great extent, and B, they may have CAA and live for a long time, but they just haven't had the time to to have an hemorrhage yet. And so the combination of all of that means that we see a relative risk of 2.7, which is statistically significant, and it's replicated in the Danish data independently. It effectively means that it's possible that the the risk is is higher than, than what we see. Earlier on, you brought up the story of CJD and iatrogenic uh, transmission through cadaveric tissue. Specifically, the neurosurgical graphs of Dura were well studied and required decades to um, ultimately develop CJD, albeit a, a different prion disease. But how do you interpret that with, in light of the findings in your study, that um, on average after the transfusion, I believe the hemorrhage risk is high even within five years, you see a separation. How is that sort of explained? There was a very nice editorial that came with our paper by Stephen Greenberg, and he's like a leading CAA researcher. And he commented on this, and I think it's been commented by people on Twitter and and on various blogs about our paper. And it's a good criticism that I don't have a very strong response to. As I said, I don't know enough about these diseases to say what would be a meaningfully long incubation time. But I would like to add one thing, which is that we are looking at a population of patients, the transfused patients, who are fairly sick from the beginning, which means that they're sick from the start. They probably drink more than the average Swede, which says a lot. They probably drive their cars into stuff a lot more often than the non-transfused patients, and they do a lot of bad things. They're probably on blood thinners to a great extent and so on. And so they'll have a much higher risk of intracerebral hemorrhage from the start, which means that the majority or a large extent or a large number of the hemorrhages in that population will have nothing to do with hemorrhages seen in their donors. And so we are not really able to truly estimate the incubation time. You can imagine that, that let's say that this takes 10 years in our data to, to develop, then there's no good way for us to demonstrate that the average time or the average incubation time is 10 years because we'll have a lot of events that, that were going to occur anyway, whether they would have been transfused or not. And so the only sort of response that I can really come up with to this criticism is, first of all, what would be a meaningfully long incubation time here? I don't know. And second of all, we don't really know what the incubation time is. And and after all, we saw a very small number of events in the Swedish cohort, which was the main cohort here, 
there were 18 events in the exposed group and in the Danish cohort, which was the replication or validation cohort, there were six events. So in total, we saw 24 exposed events. Clearly too little for us to do any sensible modeling of the actual incubation time. We did one thing though, which was that we fitted one sensitivity analysis where we delayed the exposure by five years, which would be to say that we effectively start the follow-up only among individuals who've lived five years or longer, right? And then we see the same or slightly higher relative risk, but the confidence limits become much bigger or much wider because we have fewer events in that cohort. So if anything, there's like an indication that the risk becomes bigger after five years. Another thing that's worth considering is that in the very small number of more or less confirmed CJD cases that were transfusion transmitted, the incubation times weren't all that long. I think they were more than five years, but not a whole lot more than five years, which means that, again, someone will probably correct me saying that I'm wrong, but, but, but I looked at, because I looked at this a long time ago, but they're not 35 years, so they're not 25 years. And whether that's because they were detected due to screening or something else, I don't know. But you could imagine that you transfuse someone with something which circulates all over the body. It's, so it's going to be different than a surgical case where you might have a dura graft or something like that. And there might not be a natural way for these proteins to you know, go from the dura graft into the brain and lead to widespread pathology. But then again, I'm just a mere cardiologist, so I don't really understand things about the brain. I think even for the human growth hormone transmission cases, it was longer. Yeah, you're right. It it was certainly longer. CJD is an interesting outcome because if you capture deaths, you capture it. It is uniformly fatal and um, quite rapidly. What for you was the most unexpected or perhaps surprising finding in this analysis? I'd say that the whole thing was surprising. We had a strong biologically, I think, sound hypothesis, but I really didn't expect to find anything. For the most part, I've been at this thing of studying transfusion transmission and transfusion safety for close to 20 years, and we almost never find anything. I'd say even much of the research that I've done in my career has been spent trying to show that other people's findings are wrong. And that in reality, things like the age of the donor or the sex of the donor or whatnot, they don't affect the the outcomes of the recipients and that you have to be very careful with, with doing these types of studies. And then suddenly I find something which is fairly spectacular like this. And so I would say that just the whole association seemed very surprising. And this is, of course, the explanation why it took us four years or close to four years to to go from, from the first rounds of analysis to a published paper. Because after we'd done the first set of analysis, I had two of my doctoral students redo the whole thing independently, and they came to more or less exactly the same conclusions as I did, with minimum input from me. And then we went to our Danish colleagues and asked whether we should run this in Denmark as well, and then we needed new permissions for data, and it took us a long time, and we saw more or less exactly the same thing. Now... The data is very similar in Sweden and Denmark, so if we do something wrong with the data, then that just could just be some systematic bias that we don't understand. But even so, we did replicate it in Denmark. And so this took a long time for the reason that it was such an unexpected finding. Gosh, that must have been exciting when the Danish replication came back. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it's also a little bit humbling and scary because I think most people have sensibly interpreted this very cautiously. I think JAMA, they were very sensible when they published this as preliminary communication, which I think makes perfect sense because we're using a proxy exposure. We have a proxy outcome. There are all these weaknesses to the data and to the study that are sort of unavoidable in this case. But even so, there's something scary about this, that you might be transmitting something that most people wouldn't even consider being possibly transmittable, right? Just a personal anecdote. My oldest sister had, when she was young, she had an intracerebral hemorrhage due to intravenous malformation. And she said to me, could my disease be transmissible? And we said, well, we've removed all known vascular malformations, but in reality, we don't really know what this mechanism might be. We're suggesting that it's a CAA. There are some indications in our data that this might be CAA, which we could talk about later, but this could be something completely different. This could be driven by AVM being transmissible, or this could be driven by mycotic aneurysms, or what do I know? Even so, it is a very surprising finding. Or potentially always by chance, that um, always... I think the role of chance here is probably smaller or fairly unlikely because 
although the, the, the findings in the Danish cohort is not as strongly significant, the combined effect of two significant p-values in two independent samples would be, be yeah, very unlikely. And we have published a few things, so you could argue that we've sort of worked through all the diseases and come to this conclusion that this is transmissible, but all the other things aren't. But, but that's actually not the way it happened. This happened in a very a priori way. And, and we, we have a paper coming out where we are fishing and testing all diseases, but that's done in a different way than this is. Are there other registries or data sets that you're aware of that could be used to independently verify this further? The problem is that currently there aren't. This could probably be done in places like Norway and Finland, but they're fairly small countries and they're not going to have as long standing data as we have. Some of it might be possible to do in the Netherlands, but I think they're having trouble linking health outcomes to their donors. There's talk of something similar being developed in Australia. But again, I don't know how well they would be able to capture health outcomes in their donors and their recipients. There's a series of studies in the U.S. called the RED studies. From the beginning, it was all called REDS, would be a retrovirus epidemiology donor study or something like that. But they also don't capture health outcomes in their donors. And so... In reality, we are probably the only ones who can do this, and the Danes then, of course, which we use for replication. So I would argue that the logical next step is not to start building these big registers to wait 10 years or so to see whether we can we can detect something, but rather to do this mechanistically. Our next steps are really trying to get hold of, of samples to see whether we can find these A-beta pathologies in donors and then see if develop in, in, in transfused patients. That's the, the thing we're working on currently. And then we're trying to get hold of uh, MRIs and CT scans from, from affected donors and, and recipients in Sweden to see whether it looks like CAA or whether it looks like something completely different. I'm not entirely sure how many images we're going to be able to find after all because of small numbers, big country and fairly complicated procedures. Exciting avenues of research to pursue certainly could strengthen the findings here. For me, I think it highlights that there's good reason to save data like this. And the story behind how I got most of this data is fairly interesting that the computer contractor that developed the first computer systems for blood banking in Sweden, they started doing this in 1964, I think. And the earliest data that was stored or saved was from maybe 66 or 67. And this was all stored on these old IBM half-inch tapes that were you know, in a cardboard box in the basement of this contractor where I went and picked them up and, and took them to some guy in some other basement who had an old reader and was able to decipher it. And then we spent two years trying to piece the data together and make sense of it. It was all stored in weird old undocumented IBM formats and very challenging for a second year medical student, but it was a lot of fun. At the end of the day, it leads to this database that we've used for close to 100 papers studying all aspects of transfusion care, which is, I think, a good example of why data should be stored and why under controlled situations, it should be allowed to be used for research like this. Indeed. And certainly in the United States, linking data and following individuals across different registries and contexts has become increasingly difficult. And um, even the concept of a single unique identifier for each individual would cause intracerebral hemorrhage to data privacy officers at my institution. <laughs> Causes intra and extra cerebral hemorrhage to the data privacy people here too sometimes. And I sort of sympathize with that. I don't like that Google knows stuff about me and, and I probably wouldn't like that, that people like myself knows things about me either. But sometimes you just need to see that there's like a higher purpose or, or a common good here. And and mind you, there are registers in Sweden for health outcomes that have been used for research for at least 30 years, probably more. And I'm not aware of any instance where data has leaked and led to actual issues. And there are tens of thousands of papers based on these registers, which means that there are likely tens of thousands of researchers with, which have been using these types of registers and these types of data. And I'm not aware of any instance where, where anything has leaked out or been compromised or you know someone's identity has been leaked. And this is, I think, a good example of or a good motivation for allowing this under, under controlled circumstances, of course. So I sympathize with this idea of data privacy and I sympathize with the ideas that we should limit and de-identify data, etc. But this data is not possible to fully de-identify. It's, it's impossible to conserve 
the inner consistency of the data and the identified fully. I can always be able to find particular patients if I know enough about them beforehand. What for you are the public health implications, albeit preliminary at this point, but sort of thinking about at this point or down the road, if you continue to find associations like this, how would it change the approach to donation and or transfusion? Currently, my you know pessimistic viewpoint is that this means very little for public health. You know, we're looking at a proxy outcome or a proxy exposure, which is affecting 0.1 percent of, of recipients, and they have, in absolute terms, two percent increased risk of something happening over a duration of 30 years or something like that. So, in absolute number of patients suffering from something on account of this, it's it's very very small. We need to use all the data in two countries to really be able to find it. That's how rare it is. However, if this signal or this association that we're finding is indeed driven by transmission of something leading to CAA and that our proxy exposure is bad enough that we're underestimating the true exposure, then this could be a fairly big public health implication. And so one of the reviewers of the paper wanted us to put in a number on the population attributable risk. And I I don't think we ever did because I think we can't calculate that meaningfully. And what it would tell us is that if we work these numbers into a population attributable risk calculator, then we have less than 1% of events in this population were driven by this exposure. But imagine that, that, that we turn some knobs and the exposure affects 10% of the population and the relative risk is tenfold higher, then suddenly this might be a a scary thing. I mean, that's the first starting point. The second starting point is sort of what about organ transplant recipients? You're actually selecting the donors based on them having an intratribal hemorrhage. What's the prevalence of CAA among organ donors? I don't know. It's probably higher than 0.1%. And what about tissue grafts? What about plasma donors? What about albumin? I know it's all the the thing here. You give a lot of albumin. You know, that's also a human-dried product. It's possible that purification and whatever they do to albumin product does not remove misfolded or otherwise, you know, noxious amyloid beta proteins. So if I was a regulator and interested in this, I would, I would scratch my head pretty hard and, and say, okay, we don't think this is a thing, but let's make sure. And certainly as our ability to test and understand better the preclinical markers, various disease states like CAA or Alzheimer's, as that improves, we may also begin screening yeah. donors through that. Although it does seem blood banks struggle, of course, to get enough uh, donors and enough supplies for transfusion. So I'm sure they're quite conservative when it comes to theoretic risk. I think for good reason. In this case, it's clearly premature. We, we need to know more. But, but imagine that we're suddenly looking for transfusion transmission of something which we can test for. What would be the logical next step? And I've heard some clever suggestions like you would start age matching the donors to the recipients uh, to make sure that the youngest recipients get young blood or blood from young donors, which I think would make some sense in this case, because the prevalence of amyloid beta associated pathologies is very much age dependent. It's extremely low below age 40. That would be like a proxy solution, I think. Uh, But all of this is speculative and premature. But even so, I think that regulators should look into to this with some priority. And I imagine that we will get a round of criticism about our study, which has some flaws, of course, all research does. And I'm sure we'll see a flood of animal model studies to start. And then hopefully we'll see some more tests of this in different types of human materials. Indeed. Gustav, it's been a pleasure to hear more about the study and the background as well. And really a fascinating article that I encourage um, all of our listeners to look at the September 12th JAMA that it was published in. Look forward to seeing more of the story in the years to come. Me too. I, and, and really, I mean, no one would be happier than me if I'm wrong, but I, I am a little bit curious to see what these clever animal models, I mean, the real researchers, I'm just an epidemiologist, but what these real researchers are going to find when they start getting at this with their cells and mice and whatnot. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast. 
through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes. Or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.